Philippians 4, starting at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for, for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is God's word to us. Uh, let's look at this in two parts. Let's look at the one thing that Paul says is the secret that he's learned. He said he's learned a secret, so let's look at that. What is the secret? But then let's also unpack how he has learned it, uh, what, that, what he has gone through, what that means to actually know this secret of not discontent, but contentment. So let's see. Number one, what is this secret? Paul's close to the end of the letter. He's talking to the Philippian church how their partnership in the gospel with him has been practical. He'll thank them for the gift that uh, they have sent to him. But before he gets to that, he's going to reveal something about his inner life, something about what he's doing, what he's thinking, something that God has been doing. And he'll say a couple of times in this letter, imitate me, do as I do. So that means we too pay attention to what Paul is up to, what he's thinking, what God's doing, because it also means we need to do that too. He's talking about something he's learned, his secret, he says. Uh, he talks about it in verse 11. This is where he starts talking about it. He says, not that I'm speaking of being in need. So this isn't about him and his need. But he says, I've learned in whatever situation... I am to be content. Paul is saying that he's learnt that there is a calling on his life, which is on every disciple's life, and that is one of contentment and peace. Those things aren't good ideas, being content, uh, that you get around to if you get a chance. You know, if you've got some spare time, work on your contentment this week. He doesn't say that. He actually says this is something he has been called to. He, he ought to be. It's who he's called to be. He continues in verse 12. He says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. Two sides in this journey of being content. Notice, being low, being in need and having lots. We naturally think that to be in need, that's the thing that most affects our contentment, right? The natural conditioned instinct that if we have everything we need, well, then we'll be content. We, we think that, don't we? And there's a truth in it. If you're in need, it's hard to be content, that's true. But he's saying that there's actually another side that actually attacks our contentment, and that is when you have enough, you can also find that that's difficult to be content in. Which, when I say it out loud, we know this, don't we? Uh, there are a million stories about people who have everything they want and yet are discontent. Uh, I love... There's a quote in a podcast I was listening to, The Rise of Paul and Mars Hill. And the quote was, it's hard to be truly, truly depressed until you get everything you want. And I think that that is the two sorts. Contentment's attacked from having want, and it's, contentment is attacked by having much. Paul is saying that in the, even in those two terrible extremes, 
He has been called to contentment. He's learned how to be content. And it presses onto us that we too are to know it. In riches and in poverty, there are major temptations. He goes on to say, In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. He has learned the secret, is what he says. I have to say, when I read that, I, I simultaneously, I cringe and I'm truly curious. I cringe because we have heard, we know the secret. We can be sold the secret. You know, from the first time someone stood up on a soapbox with snake oil and said, I have the secret to whatever it is that ails you, we've been used to getting sold the secret to youthful skin, to long life, to not paying tax, making your first million, to happiness. You name it. We are people who have been sold secrets for a long time. And yet I have to say, as someone who struggles, who lives in a world of discontentment, when he says the secret to contentment, for my consumeristic heart, for my wanton discontentment, well, I've got to say I'm a little bit curious as to what he's going to say would bring about this contentment. And this is where he goes. This is what he says. He does point out that it is quite impossible to be content. But in chapter 4, verse 13, we know this verse well. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I remember a footballer that before every kick to convert, this would be the line that he'd say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, through him who strengthens me. Uh, which it's such a jolt to think of him saying that when it's actually Paul in prison talking about contentment, isn't it? Put it in its context and it's different. Paul is saying that it is quite impossible to be content when you've got much and little, but here, with God himself, it is possible. How can we know contentment and lack and in lack and abundance? Well, sorry to be simplistic, but Paul says it's because God knows him and he knows God. There's a relationship a salvation based on the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It isn't going to change with circumstances because the work of Jesus Christ is fixed. It's still there no matter what happens. The longer I live, the more I see that life is flux and change. It's just inevitable. Like a ship on the sea, it rises and falls. That's what Paul knows and that's what we know. I don't like the sea. I get seasick. And yet it is kind of where I exist, up and down. And so Paul says, there are circumstances that will go up and down, plenty and want, but what you actually need is a mooring. You need to be tied to something strong and stable. It's not going to be you. It's not going to be the world. It's not going to be your circumstances. That gospel mooring is the only thing that's not going to change. Paul says there is now a king. And his kingdom will not fluctuate. And we've seen throughout this letter, he says that. Even though I've been locked up in prison, the gospel isn't stopped. We get that encouragement. If you're thinking, that's a massive anticlimax, there's a secret to being content, and you're thinking, oh, I really wanted to have it, and what Brad is saying, well, you need to know Jesus. Well, I want to say I feel you a little in that. But I also have to say, while on my worst days there are doubts that following Jesus is good, if we value God's word at all, there is a learned secret to contentment. There is something for each of us to rest in and be content, and that is being right with God. If you would like to be content, I would like to be content. In a world designed to feed my discontentment, I'd like the antidote. And Paul says one of the first things is you need a relationship with God. You need to say to Jesus, from now on, you, from now on, I give myself to you. My deepest love, longings, loyalties, they are yours. That's the first part of learning the secret of contentment. And in some ways, yes, we who know Jesus will have something the world doesn't, a contentment. If you know God, you can know contentment. You can learn contentment. Without God, there is a contentment lack. Uh, that's the first big component that Paul's going to say about contentment. Not surprising at all, but it's still vital, it's still important. Paul does say he has had to learn contentment and he gives the Philippians a bunch of things that they are to actually do. 
that will help them with their contentment. So what is, the, what is the secret? Well, it's knowing Jesus, being moored to him. But how is it learned? What do we do? This coming week, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? Good news for you, Paul actually gives us seven things to do in the lead up to that conversation. And he'll talk about peace all the way through it. So I want to call it seven life hacks to, for living with contentment, but I feel like I'm trying to sell you something in that point. It's just seven things that Paul says, if you weave these into your life, you will experience the peace of God. You'll be walking with him. So I was going to say, if you've got a church Bible, don't draw in it. But if you've got your own, mark these seven things up. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> if you've got a phone, highlight these things. There's seven things. So we're going to fly through them. Don't, don't worry, we're not going to take 15 minutes on all seven. The secret for people who lack contentment, seven things to do. Number one, he says it, verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. That's, a, that's an imperative. That is actually, you lot need to do this. Um, you want to know what the second thing that he tells us to do is? Same thing again. I'll say it again, rejoice. Ah, it's expensive to write things in the ancient world, and yet Paul says twice, you lot need to be able to rejoice. It means celebrate. <clears throat> in that time, there were all sorts of feasts that happened, feasts to other gods, feasts to emperors, celebrations. And you know what they did? They ate and they drank and they were merry. There's a bunch of things we should never do that they would do at a pagan feast. I'll give you that. But Paul is saying there's something worth copying. When that lot out there celebrate their gods and their emperors and you lot in here actually have a king that will last forever, well, rejoice. If anyone's going to know joy and make joy their thing, it's going to be you lot. So twice, one and two. Rejoice. Celebrate. I think of Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi. What are they doing? Singing. Why? Because they are celebrating, they are rejoicing. I think we need to be experts in joy. We need to get better at being joyful. Maybe I do. Maybe you can. I think we all just need to step into rejoicing. One and two, rejoice. Number three, um, make your reasonableness known, he says in verse five. Um, this is one of those instructions that are, it's to do something, but it's passive. So, uh, you know, when someone says, give my love to your family, and you say, well, okay, sure. And then you get to your family and you're like, such and such gives love. So that person, it is meant to affect that person. You are to do the thing, but it's actually meant to have an effect on someone else. This is that sort of command. He says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, the Lord is at hand. Interesting that while we are to doubly rejoice, it's actually our reasonableness, our gentleness that people are meant to experience. It makes sense that we are to be joyous, but that's located in the grace of God, the way he has been gentle to us, and so we are called to be gentle. I can't help thinking that this shapes our approach to the people around us. To those in your circles, as a Christian, you are, you are called to communicate something to everyone. And Paul does not say, communicate. make sure you tell everyone the gospel every time you see them. He doesn't say that. He's big on speaking the gospel to people. But he actually says, make your reasonableness be known to everyone. Your gentleness. I don't think it excludes telling people the gospel. But we are to communicate our gentleness. Uh, I heard on a podcast this week, um, talking about that, you know, that phrase, defending the faith, uh, that's been used often. And he actually says that's a wrong picture because for the first time in 1,600 years, we don't hold any ground. And so defend, we're actually not called to defend something in this time. We don't play a defensive game. Paul lives in a similar time, and he says instead we are to undertake the guerrilla tactic of making known our Lord's presence through our gentleness. We are not defending. We are to make advances where we can with our gentleness. And there is an urgency. The Lord is at hand, Paul says. He could return at any time. Our leading edge then is to be our reasonableness. Gentleness. Interesting. Uh, rejoice, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known. Uh, number four and five. They go together. 
Number four, deal with anxiety. He says, don't be anxious, which we all find that super easy to do, right? Every day of the week, no problem with anxiety. I think there's, uh, it's interesting here, we have, a, we have a condition that we call anxiety, which is kind of unhelpful because it's got that particular name and Paul says don't do that. Paul also say in 2 Corinthians, he daily has the anxiety for all of the churches that he leads. And so he, he is talking about something in particular. Um, don't forget, he is writing to a group of pagans for whom anxiety is a way of life. In a pagan worldview, you have to continually walk on eggshells lest you upset the wrong God, fail to appease the right God, whatever it is, you just do not know. And Paul says you don't have to live like that anymore. He says you can have a different view of the world. We have a God who's committed to us, covenanted to us, not because of what we do, but because of Jesus Christ, we have that mooring. And so I think he's saying we don't need to walk around anxious all of the time. And I don't think it's too controversial for me to say the majority of us probably do exist with anxieties we don't need to bear all of the time. And so, number four, don't be anxious, which is linked to number five, the end of the sentence, don't be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. This is the description. That in everything, nothing too petty, nothing too big, Bring your wishes and your wants. We have wishes and our wants. Wrap them in thanksgiving and inform your God of that. That's what he tells us to do. Leave them with him. Can you see the invite into a relationship? Don't be anxious, but instead give it to God. Uh, at Bishop's, you can buy a Guatemalan worry doll uh, that you tell your worries to and put underneath your pillow, and somehow that doll will deal with your worries. That's the way the fable goes, Okay. Uh, this is not an invitation to give it to a worry doll. This is an invitation to give you your wishes and your wants to the God who created everything, is over everything, and is indeed powerful. There is a contentment promised when we do the hard work of prayer, your wills, your wants, wrapped in thanks and giving to God. What's it say? The promise is that his peace, which is beyond us, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I'm not selling snake oil to say there is a promise given to us. And I want to say, why don't you try your God? Why don't you give him your cares and say, Lord, I need that peace that you promise. But I will say, you need to thank him for it when he gives it, because he will. And you probably need to tell us about it too, because it's encouraging. Okay. Uh, number six, uh, logically rally. Uh, this is verse eight that we looked at as we had Lord's Supper. Paul says that word again, finally, and he leads off with those eight things. Eight things to occupy and rally around. Um, uh, notice the picture he's painting here. He says, whatever is true, uh, whatever is honourable, that means, like, whatever is reverent, the thing, you know, we say we treat the gospel, that's the reverent thing, the thing that actually matters. Whatever is just, which is, uh, you know, the things that go with the grain of God's world, whatever is pure, whatever function God's way, Whatever is lovely, uh, I've got to say, I hate that adjective. I think it's been used too much in churches. So perhaps a, a, a word that actually also fits there is compelling. Whatever turns your heart toward God. Think on that. Whatever is commendable, which is actually, it's, it's whatever is a good report. It's actually the word where we get euphemism from. We use a euphemism to replace a bad thing with a good word. But what Paul is encouraging us to do here is give the best report of something. Whatever is a good rendering of something, don't complain. Uh, whatever is excellent or virtuous, whatever is praiseworthy, meditate on those things. Think about them. Find your rallying points and return to them. Uh, tell each other what our rallying points are so that we know. Encourage each other on those things. He says, set your minds to them. Um, Paul is saying, be super deliberate with your thoughts. I'm not a hater on tech and phones. Maybe I am, but I don't think I am. I want to say that when we pick up our phones, though, our thoughts are curated by algorithms. It is not a neutral device you hold in your hand. And so Paul is saying, be deliberate with your thoughts. Make sure you have some space in your life where it is you. Rally around something. 
make sure that your mind is not crafted by people who want to sell you things. Make sure your desires are not directed toward things. Make sure that there is a place where that happens. You'll need to pursue that, rally around that, do it deliberately. And last thing, number seven, he just says do. What you've learned from me, what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Um, Paul takes discipleship really seriously. He takes leading a church very seriously. It's only someone who knows the gravity of the gospel, is willing, who knows that he's going to be judged by God, that would say something like, what you see and hear, what you've noticed me doing, do that. That makes a church leader quake in their boots. Do what I do. Uh, I think that it um, helps us. It helps us know uh, about discipleship. That, in fact, it is finding imperfect people who are walking with Jesus, who have been well-schooled in it, and following what they do as well. I think that there is that. Maybe they are people you listen to or read. Maybe they are long-dead people, but find them... Maybe it's people here that you're able to follow, find those people. Paul is adamant though, isn't he? Do the stuff. Walk in it, practice it, make sure your life is dented by Jesus and his gospel. But I think there is another flip side to this, this challenge. Be the sort of disciple that you can model to others. Make sure you are tracking toward being a disciple that reveals who Jesus is to other people. Think of yourself like that. What's the secret? Being content, knowing Jesus. How do you do it? Practice those seven things. It's a lot of things we've just covered. Uh, and I'm going to say, finally, for the last time, finally, uh, we talk about what is it that would make us light and salt in the world? What would make us stand out? Because it's actually really quite hard to stand out in our time as a Christian. Um, I think contentment in an age of discontentment is one of those things, right? We know people. We know people who are confident. We know people who are relaxed. We know people who know recreation. Not to mention we know people who are anxious, driven, crucified by lots and lots of things. For us to work on our contentment, as Paul tells us to here, for us to know the impossible, being content. Uh, that is something else, right? Let me pray for us as we seek this big task of being content people. Lord Jesus, you come to us and you promise to us that you'll be with us, that you are the God of peace, uh, that you promise the peace of God, as we hand over our worries and anxieties, our wills and wants, as we hand them over to you. Lord, there is something in knowing Jesus Christ that is good, that is beautiful, that is worth rallying around, that does our hearts good. Lord, could you set us apart as your people to do that? You help us to rest, truly rest, that you're indeed in charge. And your gospel has shown your heart toward us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Friends, let's sing together to finish.